Pour yourself a cold one. Let's drink them, huh? And listen to Russ Tucker break down the top college prospects on another tasty edition of The College Draft. Yeah, it's Daddy Soda time here on a Memorial Day Monday edition of the College Draft Podcast, presented as always by DraftKings. Highly encourage you, always really, but especially today, to check out the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. I have Army veteran Brett Toth, spent two years in the Army after going to West Point. Now he's an offensive lineman for the Eagles on the show. Perfect guest, right, for Memorial Day. And then also Cam Jurgens, another Eagles offensive lineman. Second round pick last year was dynamic, fantastic in the preseason last year. He has a great chance to be their starting right guard. So you can hear the interviews with both those young men on today's Ross Tucker football podcast. Plus, I go over the latest news like Jimmy Garoppolo, foot surgery. I mean, that's just not good. That That's not good. That that's the Raiders starting quarterback. They signed him and the foot hadn't healed and he had to have surgery for it. it. Has not been a good time for the Raiders. Today, though, we are continuing our critically acclaimed series where we actually talk about every guy that got drafted in the NFL draft and the best undrafted free agent for every team. We've already done the NFC East, NFC South, NFC North. Today, we're going to finish up the NFC with the NFC West, then obviously over the next month or so, we'll get to the AFC. And before you know it, we'll already be talking about the top prospects for next year as we start to go conference by conference, talking about the top dudes, getting you guys ready for college football in 2023. Not really me, though. It's really more Emery because he's the expert. Check him out on social media at FBall Game Plan on Twitter. He's got a very popular YouTube page, Football Game Plan on YouTube. The draft guide I'm a huge fan of. Nobody else evals as many guys as Emory, other than the teams, other than the actual team that have like a staff of like 30 guys. Footballgameplan.com slash 2023 draft guide. The great Emory Hunt. You can check me out on social media, of course, at Ross Tucker NFL. Love that you do. If you have this weekend, you've seen what I've been eating. You've seen what I've been drinking. Maybe that doesn't interest you. It should because it's all been delicious. My wife is addicted to lobster rolls, I think, at this point. So check it out, at Ross Tucker NFL. And then, of course, we put the highlight clips of this show, at Ross Tucker Pod, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL. Emery, always good to talk with you. Happy Memorial Day. Let's start uh, with the Arizona Cardinals. We talked about them drafting Paris Johnson Jr. But now let's get to round two and round three. Round two, they took B.J. Ojolari, edge rusher from LSU. Round three, they took Garrett Williams, a corner from Syracuse, and Michael Wilson, a wide receiver from Stanford. I'll say this, Emery. I know a lot of people that really liked Ojolari. And I had multiple scouts tell me they really liked Garrett Williams from Syracuse. Yeah, and Williams is someone that was flying under the radar for a lot of people, and he has good athleticism, good skill set. I think he dealt with a lot of injuries uh, at Syracuse, uh, but he is someone that definitely is on the rise in terms of may even be a quote-unquote better pro than he was in college. Ojolari, to me, is a lot like my Jay Sanders, who they drafted last year. So in my eyes, he kind of gives them you know, good rotational depth as a pass rusher. You want to keep that wave of pass rush coming. I know he fell to round two. Some people thought he was going to go in round one. Michael Wilson was my number one split in, my number one X receiver. This dude is tremendous as a route runner, as a uh, a guy that can go up and attack the football. Great receiving skill set. The asterisk, as we talked about before, if he stays healthy. So that's the thing, because we saw down at the Senior Bowl, that week, he was phenomenal, one of the best receivers, if not the best receiver down there in attendance. Um, but you always wonder if he's going to be out there for a full 17-game season. So his injury concerns is why he fell to round three. But his skill set definitely is round one material. Wow. I didn't know he was that good. Yeah. He is good. He is, he is someone to me, like when you talk about he can win short, 
He can win over the middle. He can win deep down the field. Knows how to stack and, and track the ball. He knows how to attack the ball at his highest point. He can win with that athleticism, quickness, all the things that you want your receiver to do. So that he wasn't out there consistently for Stanford because he kept dealing with an injury here, injury there. But when he's on the field, he's tremendous. Let's talk about uh, some of their mid-round picks. By the way, they also stockpiled a lot of picks for next year. Round four, John Gaines, a guard from UCLA. Round five, they took Clayton Toon, the quarterback from Houston, and Owen Pepo, the linebacker from Auburn. Toon is someone that was was intriguing and definitely helps them uh, within the depth chart. You got an older Colt McCoy who's still out there playing ball. You love that about you know him. He's still out there competing, um, but he, he's competing with Jeff Driscoll and David Blau. So to me, Toon is is in line to be their QB two. Has some skill set that you like. You know he can really drive the football well. Has a, a good base of athleticism that he can get out there and move. Kind of like Colt McCoy, maybe not the runner Colt McCoy was in his younger years, but definitely someone that's not a statue either uh, that can compete. And when you think about someone like Gaines, watching Zach Charbonnet, you kind of draw your eyes toward Gaines and what he was doing up front. Very good interior offensive lineman, continues to stockpile that depth. And someone like Cottrell Clark, another guy that they got out of Louisville, um, click and close corner, very good in that regard. He's an excellent slot defender. So stockpiling depth while also stockpiling picks for next season. You can see where this team is going to turn the roster over, but they want to get young, good quality depth. I thought this particular class accomplished that goal. So what about Dante Stills, the uh, D tackle from West Virginia? How many Stills are they going to have come through West Virginia? And how many Dante Stills are they going to I feel like we talked about him coming out every year. I feel like uh, Dante Stills came out of West Virginia last year, but he is good. He is someone – that when you watch him in a hand-to-hand combat type situation, winning one-on-one versus interior offensive lineman, he's rock solid in that regard, can pressure the quarterback, can play the run rather well, has great eyes for the position. Him going in round six was a shock to me, but this is another good football player that can help, at worst, uh, increase the depth there within the front seven. This is a roster, I don't think it is bad as it, as people are making it out to be, especially on defense. Um, it all depends on whether or not they're going to get a, a healthy or when they get the healthy Kyler Murray back. This roster isn't as bad as it as people are making it out to be. They can be competitive here this season. So uh, do you think Stills would go higher or wouldn't get drafted at all? I thought he would go higher. I, I thought he would probably go within the – I know we're talking two rounds ahead. I thought he's at worst a fourth rounder uh, based off his productivity and what he's able to do on the interior. But that's how weird the draft is. The draft tends to fall – certain way to where, you know, there's a run on a position which pushes other positions down. And it just so happened that, you know, he went in round six. But I think the Cardinals got themselves a really good player. What about on the undrafted free agent front, Emery? I know you're always on top of that. It's one of my favorite things to ask you. Uh, Imari DiMarcado, the running back out of TCU. If you remember him, he stepped up big when Kendra Miller got injured against Michigan. And he really helped them you know, close out that game against the the Wolverines, had a nice big chunk run touchdown to really put the nail in the coffin. So he also had a really good week out the NFL PA Bowl. And to me, this is someone that can help come in. And we've seen him play well within a reserve role. Doesn't need volume. This is the type of situation where he can step in and and provide some type of, uh, you know, offensive output in a limited role because we know James Conner is their guy. Let's talk about, the L.A. Rams, a team that it feels like they're in transition. They went from F them picks, Emery, to give me all them picks. I mean, how many guys did they draft? The list, I'm looking at it, just goes on and on and on. They didn't have any first-round picks. But then uh, second round, they took Steve Avila, the guard from TCU. Round three, Byron Young, an edge guy from Tennessee, and Kobe Turner, D tackle from Wake Forest. That was the Richmond kid, right? Yep. And for me, I give the Rams an A because this is why they're able to say F them early picks, Ross, because they do a fantastic job with their scouts and their scouting department of nailing the back end of the draft and also the undrafted free agent market. So you just listed three guys, right? All three guys were tremendous football players with some versatility. Avila is someone that some people saw as a, a, a tackle, but now is going to play guard. Very fantastic player 
at TCU. You talk about Byron Young, the second Byron Young in this draft. We had one from Alabama. This is one uh, from Tennessee that can really get after the quarterback. Tremendous role to his success uh, at Tennessee. And now he's someone that can probably fill that role kind of along the same lines of what they had in Samson Ebucom. They get that in uh, uh, Byron Young. And you also brought up Kobe Turner. Some people thought he was going to be a first-round pick. They get him in round three. Nice under tackle that can collapse a pocket and get to the QB. Probably is your ideal three technique. So for me, this was a, a great start to their draft without having a first or second round pick. Then let's get to round four, which was interesting. They took Stetson Bennett, the quarterback from Georgia. You talked about him a lot, Emery. You seem to be higher on him than the rest of the scouting community, and the Rams agreed with you. Yeah, here's the thing. When you watch him play, it, people got caught up in the narrative about Stetson Bennett you know, two-time walk-on, you know, had to go to JUCO, come back, and they just kind of got hung on that story, but they ignored how he was actually playing out there on the field. You saw someone that could throw well on the move, has a live arm stronger than people think, and also is a gamer. When you talk about guys that get out there and play well in a, in a clutch situation, you can't get any better than what Stetson Bennett put out there the last couple of years for Georgia and was a big reason why they won their second national championship because he played phenomenal ball. And so when you think about the rest of this depth chart, there's a chance for him to be at the QB too. And because we don't know what type of Matt Stafford we're going to get, he may even be in line to be their QB of the future um, because we know he's played a lot of games. We know he played a lot of big games. So he's battle tested and does what they want at the position. Think about what left the room. John Wolford was athletic and threw well on the move. Bryce Perkins was athletic and threw well on the move. Those guys are gone. Now they bring in a Stetson Bennett, who's already going to be their QB too and has – you know, a lot more upside than people think. So I, I like the pick. I like Stetson Bennett. I feel like he's a really good player. And they, in the fifth round, they took Puka Nakua out of BYU, who was on the verge of having a fantastic week of work at the Senior Bowl. But then on one play was a tremendous catch. His head hit the back of the – or the back of his head hit the ground, and he was out the rest of the week with a concussion. But on that play, he made one of the best catches of the week, early in the week, but he didn't practice the rest of the week because he had a, a concussion. He took it easy. But this is another guy that is a really good receiver um, coming out of that BYU program. So they did a, I think they did a great job on that back end, man, like just looking at some of these picks uh, in the fourth and fifth round. Nick Hampton, edge rusher, App State, Warren McClendon Jr., the other tackle for Georgia, and Davis Allen, the tight end from Clemson, Emery. <laughs> I mean, Nick Hampton – you watch uh, App State play defense, and that's another one of these sight unseen programs. Kansas State, Utah, App State defender, I'm sold. Because this is someone that can really pressure the quarterback. And he was, you know, listed undersized, I think 6'2", 236 or whatever. But, you know, he, he has a, a, a pathway to get to the quarterback, kind of built like Byron Young. Um, but, again, uh, back loading their, their draft, getting guys that can do multiple things, Getting good football players um, is the key here, and that's why they stay competitive. I know last year to me was an anomaly, but you're getting guys like that that are really good. And again, uh, Travis Hodges Tomlinson in the sixth round, he's short, not small. He's, you know, he's good muscle tone and able to play above the rim. You know, and it, guys tend to challenge him because he's a shorter corner, but he's always around the football. He's probably going to be inside, but I wouldn't. You know, put him inside so quickly, you could let him try outside. I think he's good enough to do that, but he's definitely going to be a nickel defender and another guy that can take the ball away. So it's it's hard to to really knock the Rams for the job they did uh, in the you know third through seventh round. And O'Shane Mathis, O'Shawn Mathis, another one of these athletic guys that can play across the linebacker uh, front. To me, can play any one of the positions. So it's going to be fascinating to see how he's going to how he's going to fit into this Rams. A defense, but this is someone that could be a core special teamer from day one. Zach Evans, a running back from Ole Miss. Jason Taylor, the second, the safety, Oklahoma State, and Des Johnson, DN Toledo. Yeah, Des Johnson is really good, man. I, I love him. I love this game. Um, Zach Evans, fantastic running back. Then the guy that people thought was going to go probably in round two, uh, but he has good overall feel for the run game, good burst, um, fits what they want in the backfield. Someone that doesn't need volume to be successful. And Taylor, I was shocked to, to really see him go this late in round seven because he's someone that played a lot of ball, very good football player. Again, that's a common theme here, and they got him in round seven, has good instinct, can play either free or a strong safety, 
and has very good uh, football IQ, in my opinion. So this was a, a really good draft uh, for the Rams. And, and just jumping right into the, you know, the undrafted free agents, I mean, where can you start? I'll just list a bunch of guys that I think got a really good chance. And you look at this roster, they're, they're littered with rookies, right? So if you look at on, on our lads, you know, they separate, you know, veterans in blue and rookies in green. This entire roster feels like it's all green, right? So that tells you there are going to be a lot of undrafted guys that make the roster. Braxton Burmeister, former quarterback at San yeah. Diego State. I was at the Tropical Bowl when he made the transition to uh, wide receiver. was at the College Gridiron Showcase where he started that process and was phenomenal. You thought he played receiver his entire career, how good he looked, how explosive he looked and how natural he was at beating guys off press coverage and working himself open deep down the field. Cameron McCutcheon, another very good receiver that they were able to get as an undrafted free agent. Xavier Smith out of FAMU, slot guy, a, a dart and dash type you know, receiver that can also help you out as a kickoff and punt returner. That's another good pick. You look at Tyon Evans out of Louisville, the running back, was started his career at Tennessee, was good at Tennessee, transferred to Louisville, was excellent there as well. And, I mean, it's just phenomenal to see how many times you go down this list and see guys that can play as an undrafted free agent. So when you're able to get these type of players that are good football players technically for free, they help out your football team. And I think the Rams is a sneaky pick in the NFC West to be, a, a, if not number two in the division, to challenge whether it's Seattle or San Francisco. But they can be a fly in the ointment team I think they're better than Arizona, um, even with this young roster. I think this is the type of young roster to help rejuvenate a Sean McVay. Check out myfrontpagestory.com, by the way. Father's Day, a couple weeks away. You need to get a story for your dad or any of the dads in your life. Myfrontpagestory.com. All right, Emery, let's get to the Niners. No first or second round picks. Round three, they took Jair Brown, the safety from Penn State, and Cameron Latou, the tight end from Alabama. We don't talk about kickers on the show. <laughs> well, listen, Cameron Latou is someone that is a good blocker, was one of the highly touted recruits coming out of high school, but definitely feels a role here as their tight end. And we know they're going to get work done with their tight end. So the fact that he can block puts him out there early, and I think he's an underrated receiver. Jair Brown, I love the fact that he's able to get over top of the deep ball, make plays on the ball, and they had to get better in the safety position because we saw how Seattle was able to attack them vertically down the field in that playoff game. I think right out of the gate, they went deep down the field. Now you got a safety that can help take that away. Jair Brown's a really good football player. Uh, and Daryl Luter, they got out of South Alabama in the fifth round, coming off another great career in the Sun Belt Conference, another great week of work at the Senior Bowl, but also someone that is a very good man-to-man -man corner. And you can't have enough good man corners uh, in the game and D Winters in the sixth round uh, linebacker of out of TCU fantastic defender another guy that you think oh how the hell he gets down in round six I know there's some questions about you know athleticism and whatnot but he's always around the ball and give me those defenders that don't play offense that's always around the ball end up with the ball in their hands those are the guys that usually are very good football players and Ronnie Bell in round seven solid receiver uh, definitely fits what they look for. Big body guy that can, you know, make things happen after the catch. And I think they got a good one here in Bell. I feel like he was there forever. Even Georgia guys I'd never heard of, like Robert Beal Jr. go in the fifth round. Braden Willis went in the seventh round, the tight end from Oklahoma. And Jalen Graham, linebacker from Purdue, went seventh round as well. Yeah, and here's the thing. When you think about these guys that go in, you know, from Georgia that go late, and you're like, well, how, how does happen? How, how does – Robert Bill go late, but Bill is someone I think is going to be an outstanding special teamer, good core special teamer, but also was a, a smart football player. And those guys don't get you beat on a football field. You not, you tip into, you know, their undrafted rookie free agent markets, and, and it's still some of these, you know, some of the same things. Isaiah Winstead um, was on my first team all dog team, right? He was my number two inside receiver because his teammate C.J. Johnson was my number one. Both from East Carolina, and both were coached by Latrell Scott, one of the best receiver coaches in college football and developing talent as well. Winstead plays like a guy uh, in George Pickens. You know, he was this year's version of George Pickens in terms of how he plays with that dog mentality. So I'm a big fan of him, and I'm, I'm glad he's getting that opportunity. Shea White is another one out of Tulane, that a really good receiver 
can find his way open. Uh, good core special teams candidate. So I thought they did a good job there uh, bringing in some other receivers as well. Then you look at uh, the Seattle Seahawks. And we talked about their round one picks a bunch. We even talked about them taking Charbonnet in the second round. <laughs> but they also took Derek Hall, the edge rusher, from Auburn in the second round, Emery. Yeah, Hall is intriguing. You know, and if he has the body type that Seattle wants, that Pete Carroll likes at that end, kind of along the lines of what they had in Daryl Taylor. So, you know, when you have a type, you draft toward that type because you're able to get production out of that type. So it makes sense when you think about it in that sense of their defense, their scheme, their fit. I think that's why they were, you know, felt comfortable going with someone like Derek Hall. Round four, they took Anthony Bradford, guard LSU, Cameron Young, D tackle Mississippi State. Round five, Mike Morris, the end at Michigan, felt like he was there forever. And Olu Oluwatimi, the center from Michigan. I feel like the Seahawks draft a guard from LSU every year, but this year it was Bradford. What do you got on those four guys? Yeah, it's funny because Bradford was someone that was kind of felt like he was there forever at LSU um, and, and got himself in, into a position where he can get drafted. And a lot of their big runs came right down the middle. So you're helping bolster your depth there. All of a team is another reason you bolster your depth. And I thought he was, you know, someone that was underrated in this process as well as Mike Morris. I kind of like Mike Morris a lot. Um, and they got him in the fifth round. I thought that was someone that, you know, probably could have gone a little bit earlier in the draft, maybe round two, round three, depending on when that start, uh, that run on DNs went. So I, I kind of like that pick um, and where they got him. So, again, building depth on the back end, because when you look at this depth chart before the draft, they were light on the defensive interior. They were light on the edge, and they addressed it both you know, spots uh, with their draft picks. Then you got round six, Jarek Reed, a safety from New Mexico, and round seven, a name a lot of people in college football are familiar with, Kenny McIntosh, the running back from Georgia. Well, that's the thing. When you look at, I just talked about the defensive uh, front, uh, defensive line, and how they were thin going into the draft. Running back room was depleted. You know, there a lot of guys leaving. Travis Homer was a core special team. He was gone. Uh, they lose, you know, uh, Rashad Penny in the offseason. So they had to go and get, you know, replace those guys. So they got Charbonnet to help with the running. And McIntosh is a very good receiver, great special teamer, great teammate. You didn't hear a peep out of him. Uh, at Georgia, despite the guys that were in front of him, he kind of played his role and played it well. So he kind of they kind of plugged and played with with these guys to quote unquote use that term. They got their their backup running back, their Rashad Penny and Zach Charbonnet, and they got their Travis Homer and Kenny McIntosh in round seven. So you know, I thought the Seahawks did a solid job in, in working the draft, and you know they they really did a great you know job, and also in the undrafted free agent market, Chris Smith, University of Louisiana. Kind of in the same mold with Kenny McIntosh. Helps him instantly, I think, as a return specialist. Very good receiver coming off a great NFL PA Bowl um, as well. And, you know, C.J. Johnson. We just talked about Isaiah Winstead for uh, San Francisco. Well, C.J. Johnson lands in Seattle. Big physical receiver that can play the inside role, can play outside if need, if need be. He's a, a willing blocker. Does a good job in that regard, honestly. I mean, it was another one that had a really good week of work at the NFL PA Bowl. And I think this is someone I thought was going to get drafted. You go and watch his game against Coast Carolina. Fantastic job he did out there in his last college football game. A few things, Emery. Number one, everybody was just making fun of the Seahawks for taking Charbonnet in the second round or Kenny McIntosh in the seventh. But it makes a lot of sense the way you just framed it. They're they're replacing the guys they lost in Penny and Homer. I hadn't heard anybody else say that. So love that part of it. The other thing is just hearing you talk, man, and I already know this, obviously, but, man, there's a lot of really good players that don't get drafted. I mean, there's a lot of guys whose names you bring up. I'm like, oh, yeah, Isaiah Winstead. Like, you almost forget that they don't get drafted. Just goes to show how hard it is to be one of those NFL draft choices. Check this man out on social media. He is excellent at FBall Game Plan on Twitter, Football Game Plan on YouTube. We're over at youtube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL. You can check us out at Ross Tucker Pod or at Ross Tucker NFL on social media. Other than that, the keg is kicked. We are all tapped out. 
Thanks for listening to the College Draft Podcast. Make sure to also subscribe to the Ross Tucker Football Podcast, Fantasy Feast, Even Money, and the Business of Sports. All available at Apple Podcasts, RossTucker.com, or wherever podcasts can be found.